I want to kick things off just so that uh, we do uh, run on time, especially when it comes to those particular panel discussions. And the first speaker that I'm going to be welcoming on stage, he is going to be talking to us about Africa's international trade patterns since 2000 and the prospects for the ensuing decade. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Gulam Balam. He's the chief economist and head of research at Standard Bank. Gulam, thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you for having me again at GTR. So uh, a fairly dull and mundane topic, which I selected, in fact, and one that perhaps I, I suggested to myself would be ambitious. It's always a little difficult articulating trade patterns, given the multiple layers to trade. There's values, there's volumes, there's nominal prices, there's historical inflation-adjusted prices, there is various underlying types of elements and items in commodity baskets and distinguishing between exports, imports, and trade balances. And at least conveying it in images is a little difficult, but I hope I will not fail you. I don't have too much theater, but I, I do hope that the little theater that I've brought along will at least uh, mildly enthrall. Now, there's four installments to my visit with you. As suggested by the title, I just want to give you some sense, looking through the rearview mirror, of Africa, more specifically Sub-Saharan Africa's trade relations with the world over the last, say, 25 years or so, and the manner in which that has evolved and what that could portend for the next few years. The second chapter is to talk very briefly about intra-Africa trade, just giving you some perspective on how that is evolved and also prospects. The third element of my presentation, not included in the little blurb marketing this slot, but of course necessary for me to focus on is the Russia-Ukraine matter as it relates to African commerce. And as a subsector of that, I'll focus on South Africa and Russia-Ukraine relationships, not suggesting South Africa is a bigger brother than any other African country, but perhaps just uh, emphasizing South Africa's role, given that it is a giant, at least in the region, and, well, you are in South Africa right now, and perhaps there'd be a curiosity surrounding that. So with that as the landscape for the next little less than half an hour, and, and perhaps as a preamble to my presentation. I just want to make two, maybe three points. Over the last 30 years, of course, we have witnessed globalization full throttle. And many of us may think of it as the fervent levels of trade, the pools of capital finding new geographies. But globalization over the last 30 years was also about the great doubling. And when I say great doubling, I mean the fact that the globally integrated workforce doubled over the last 30 years or so, as China, India, and a little bit of Brazil's workforce joined the global system. Now, if I just pause there, very clearly one would suggest the idea of a great doubling in terms of a significant swell in the global labor force is unlikely. And already that portends the suggestion that globalization may function at a slightly lower pace than that that we've been familiar with over the last 30 years. It's hardly an elegant term, and I certainly don't want to be suggesting that I'm coining it, but in the ensuing years it may be slow globalization in a sense that I don't think we're going to experience a manifest wholesale retreat in globalization. And of course, there is now the digital veins that also introduce a new level of integration into this idea of the global village. But it will be different. Indicatively, what I would say as a preamble statement, over the last 30 years or so, we've been familiar with trade growth at a pace roughly three times GDP growth. It's astonishing. Absolutely astonishing that it could function, trade growth across the seas and other methods could function at three times the level of GDP. But already that has been slowing. 
and I would be unsurprised if it falls to two and maybe even slightly better than a factor, a ratio of one, a multiplier of one. Trade growth more or less mimicking GDP growth. And I think that is perhaps the single defining dimension factor metric that perhaps articulates the prospects over the near to medium terms in terms of, of trade. It's also perhaps worth mentioning that Africa's growth mosaic has altered a little bit in recent years. So for example, in the early 2000s, we had the continent and the region's big economies growing at a fervent pace. Remember Nigeria growing at near 8%, Angola too, South Africa rushing ahead at near 5% trend growth in the early 2000s. More recently, those big economies have slowed. And if anything, West Africa, emphasis on Nigeria and Angola, will struggle to eke out growth better than 3%. South Africa, anemic at around 2%. So the big economies are slow compared to the type of performance that they showed at the onset of this millennium, at the onset of the century. East Africa, though, has been resilient. Resilient in a sense of not growing as quick as the dynamos in the early part of this uh, century, growing at around 5%, but able to career fairly resiliently through the GFC, in, during the commodity Christ, commodity volatility in around about 2015, 2016, and even now still able to muster near 5% growth. Of course, there are other driving forces that will shape the trading patterns over the near to medium term, and I'm only mentioning a few. And perhaps the emphasis on internal idiosyncratic growth is because local growth is a facilitator for trade. In the same way, trade can be a contributor to local GDP growth. There is a bi-directional relationship, but I'm just highlighting the softening in growth. So onto Africa's trade patterns, and particularly my point about the international trade pattern over the last three decades. Now, I guess in so many facets of analytics, one comes across images or data which is just simply emblematic of the time that is quite gripping. Or maybe I'm just geekish and nerdish and find something gripping that you wouldn't. Now, the exhibit you're looking at now gives you a sense of the share of sub-Saharan Africa's trade across the world. And so the blue section suggests that at least in 1995, Europe accounted for slightly more than half of all of Africa's trade, an astonishing level of dominance only 25 years ago, 27 years ago. In the, in the yellow quadrant, you see North America accounting for a little bit more than a quarter of Africa's share of trade. Of course, a great deal of that would have been oil, oil shipping to the United States, especially from producers such as Nigeria. Asia, a little bit more than a quarter, um, but it's telling to note China was, was fairly minuscule uh, in that part of the region and broader other Asia occupied a fair share. I don't think that there has been sw such swift shifts in less than three decades in modern economic history. So if we look, for example, at Europe, as I said to you, a little bit more than half, Europe has shrunk significantly. The UK was fairly dominant 25 years ago. And if you look at not just the UK, well, most notably, but also Italy and other regions in that, uh, other countries in that region, most notably France and even the Netherlands, the manner in which, yes, they've grown nominally in trade, but their share has shrunk formidably. North America, too, has seen its share shrunk and shrink, and of course the local increase, or at least the increase in shale, has been significant in displacing sub-Saharan African oil, and as I said earlier, Nigerian oil quite significantly. But it is perhaps to highlight the manner in which Asia, with emphasis on China, which of course is not a novel narrative, you all know this well, the point of this image was just perhaps to articulate it as graphically and as statistically robustly as possible. So as I say, this is, it's gripping. And while I'm not going to suggest that 
Asia's usurping of market share from the West is going to continue. Um, and I'll make some remarks a little later, but perhaps a consolidation and anchoring of this very strong position, a consolidation of this strength would seem to be uh, a likely prospect over the, over the near term. But in essence, so-called South-South chords now dominate. The role of the West, admittedly still very significant as a source of capital for the pools of capital that reside in that market, but at least in terms of trade and prospectively also in services, the new kids on the block, very much in line with the changed geopolitical multipolar framework that we would be familiar with. Now, with respect to this exhibit, just to give you some sense of the nature of trade or the underlying composition of trade. And while there has been this breadth of change, there hasn't been the similar breadth of change or evolution in terms of the product set. So with this exhibit, I'm just trying to highlight how there is a very significant reliance on commodities with accents on fuel. So in other words, this just dominates, um, or at least it is significant in its overall contribution to the African export basket. And beyond fuels, other minerals as well, which I'll highlight in a moment. This exhibit also shows the cyclical pattern, the fairly volatile total exports figure. And inherent in that is quite simply reinforcing the notion of this dependence on fuels and, of course, the volatility in fuel prices, therefore shaping the overall value, giving it that cyclical profile. And already it teases the necessity for Africa to be developing its industrial base, developing its export prowess, and even for intra-Africa trade. And already that alludes to some of the hurdles that may be encountered by the African Free Trade Agreement, which I, again, will enunciate a little further in a moment. If we look a little bit further into the composition, just delving beyond just fuels, again, you can see the dominance of the resources complex. So ores and minerals, pearls and precious stones. It is a little comforting, at least within the time frame shown here over the last 10 years, that some of the manufactured items, such as machinery, such as food, is growing. But it's growing quite slowly, quite clearly. And of course, the shrinkage in mineral fuels and oil is a most part a function of the lower prices fetched for fuels relative to, say, 10 years ago. So it's a price effect rather than necessarily a diminishing in the overall relevance of oils um, in, in, the, in the mosaic, in the basket. Now, with this particular exhibit, and a quick glance just to highlight some of the, the distribution of exports, and to the extent that the blue zone within each pie chart features prominently, it simply reinforces, I guess, to a degree, that the resources complex matters in most geographies. Yes, with regard to Europe, food features second. So food is relatively more prominent. It is clearly less so the case in Asia. Um, but ultimately, especially this decade and ensuing periods, one could argue, unless power and the industrial base of the continent graduate from mostly light industry in many places to a more sophisticated level of industrial base, and maybe in the aftermath of supply chain risks that manifested due to the pandemic, that this could be occasion for an acceleration in that endeavor. Now turning to exactly the same image, or at least the same theme, but with regard to imports, underscoring the absence of an industrial base um, and the dependence on foreign engineering, machinery imports are substantial. Obviously, increasingly from Asia, although Europe remains a fairly significant supplier, as articulated by this particular image. So North America, significant supply of machinery and equipment, of course related to the fact that America's forays or policy, economic diplomacy in Africa has really been through its firms, through its corporate sector, through American domiciled multinationals. 
Europe significant as well, in a sense, but Asia growing in its uh, supply of machinery and equipment over the recent times. Now, a bit of a dense chart, but I'll guide you through it very quickly. And the idea behind this, if we look at just the white shaded lines, is to show you global shares of trade. So the very first white shaded line on the top is just to give you a sense of the scale of growth in trade, at least since 1948. Uh, and an astonishing drift upwards from 59 billion dollars to more than 17 trillion dollars. But lower down, what we attempt to show you is the shares of trade over this roughly last 70 years or so. And you can see how North America has almost consistently declined in its share and its industrial place in the world to about half of what it was 70 years ago. Um, a similar, if not more accelerated, subsidence for South and Central America. Europe enjoyed some resurgence up until the 1970s, but then receding, retreating to about more or less where it was 70 years ago. You could argue that Europe has shown uh, at least a deft hand at attempting to preserve its historical status. Africa has seen its share fall to a fraction of what it was, from about 7% to a little bit more than 2%, more or less mimicking the continent's share of GDP in the globe. Um, and then Middle East at the bottom with a similar subsidence. So reinforcing the first exhibit in terms of uh, the tilt in, in re with respect to global production to, to the East and forsaking of share by historical industrial dynamos. Turning to the second uh, portion, and so that I don't overstay my welcome, uh, the early 2000s was a fairly vibrant period for the growth in intra-Africa trade. And as I would have hinted at earlier on, the fact that you had some of the big economies growing fairly rapidly, generating fervent growth in per capita income, uh, was also lively for the purposes of trade. And more subdued performance, more laterally, has also seen that level of intra-Africa trade ease quite noticeably. Uh, but the fact that within Africa there's also a fair amount of resources trade, so the cyclical, the bouncy profile in the more recent decade also hints to both the reliance of commodity trade amongst African countries and the price volatility therein um, framing the overall trade profile. And just to give you some sense of intra-Africa trade by country status, Quite clearly, this exhibit would celebrate South Africa as being one of the most dominant trade partners. And it's perhaps unsurprising, given the level of industrial base, more than 100 years old, although still linked to the resources trade and beneficiation from the resources trade. The other countries that feature prominently, you see the DRC there, for example, um, a resources function. But for the most part, South Africa uh, in that respect. Now, I did say I would allude to the Russia-Ukraine dynamic as it relates to trade. Now, in most part, Russia is quite small in Africa, and the same for Ukraine. And so how the developments in far Europe far will impact, far Eastern Europe will impact Africa will be mostly indirectly. The manner in which it trips global growth the volatility in financial markets, what it implies for inflation and rates, and also in tourism. Because Europe more broadly, but at least, for example, with respect to Egypt, 40% of Egypt's tourists sourced from Russia and Ukraine. Um, but for the most part, and this is not to sound dismissive, but Russia and Ukraine, as one would expect, feature quite shallow in terms of the trade profile of the continent. It is really, as you can see in this exhibit, just Malawi that has a, a fairly high level of trade at around 6-7% at times, with uh, Ukraine on the left of the exhibit and Russia on the right-hand side image. And that's mostly tobacco. But for the most part, fractional levels of commercial endeavor. 
In terms of tourist receipts, this can matter to the continent slightly more. One, if the conflict continues, is extended, and to the extent that it drifts further west and suppresses source markets such as Western Europe, quite clearly that is going to impede the tourism dynamic, which has been recovering quite handsomely on the continent in recent months after the artificial lockdowns uh, and crimp to tourism from the pandemic. And as I said a moment ago, Egypt is perhaps the only nation that stands tall on the continent with regard to its dependence on Russia uh, at a very sizable 40%, as I've indicated. Now, of course, most of us will sometimes think about Russia within the BRICS constellation, because the BRICS constellation was a very significant catalyst for diplomacy, trade, financial inflows, and also for engaging in geopolitical affairs for the last two decades or so. And one is inclined to ask, of course, how has that developed and evolved, and which of those four partners, let's forget South Africa for a moment, within BRICS, as the S in BRICS, but how have the other four partners evolved in terms of this association over the last two decades? And of course, I already hinted it in the opening gambit. But this exhibit gives you Russia-Africa trade and at less than $20 billion at best, um, and not, again, to sound dismissive, but it really is puny. If you consider, for example, trade worth, uh, and these are, this is in um, dollars, as you can see, trade worth the European Union is $100 billion, or thereabouts, I'm rounding, I'm rounding up, in fact, uh, compared to less than about, well, about a billion dollars more recently. So the Russia dependency isn't significant. And through the lens of this pie chart, you can see the manner in which Russia is quite minuscule. In fact, even slightly surpassed um, by, by Brazil, at least, or close to Brazil, I should say. Uh, but certainly surpassed by China and India as relates to the BRIC, BRICS partners' trade with the continent. It only reinforces my point about the indirect channels rather than the direct channels. Same more or less analysis with regard to South Africa. One would have expected even greater relations with South Africa between South Africa and Russia slash Ukraine. But in fact, less than 1% of South Africa's trade is with that part of the world. 0.7% uh, for imports, about 1% for exports. Quite, quite minuscule. Um, again, for what it's worth, the nature of the trade is rooted in, in minerals. Uh, for the most part. And as you can see, South Africa exports to Russia slightly outweighed by imports, so South Africa ordinarily runs a trade deficit. But within the, the minerals trade, Mark, you can see Russia sits at the end uh, of South Africa's dependence on foreign fuels, imported fuels, imported energy. So displacement from the Russian market is not necessarily or at all going to meaningfully topple South Africa's energy security. Drawing close to the end and just looking at financial stocks, financial inflows. Um, again, in this exhibit with Russia towards the tail end, Russia's foreign stock of capital that is accumulated over the years in South Africa is, is quite small quite puny compared to other, other, other zones. But of course, all this wouldn't be surprising given that Russia's foreign policy for years has also been focused more on Europe and maybe around the energy dynamic and energy dependency of Europe and Russia, alongside Russia's more broader foreign policy ambitions. Africa has been peripheral in Russia's sights, unlike, for example, China, where the continent has been both a market for beta testing its goods in its early development stages, and then a more substantial and continuing market as China developed more substantial manufacturing prowess. Also, perhaps China saw Africa differently to the extent that it very quickly figured out that 54 African nations could lend enormous diplomatic heft to China uh, in the forums of geopolitical contestation, whether it's the IMF, the World Bank, or the United Nations. So a small continent in terms of GDP size at around 
but enormously weighty in terms of diplomatic heft that it can lend to a, an ally. And China was, was very um, smart and at the vanguard of driving this endeavor. So coming to a conclusion in terms of my visit with you, and I won't extend, just to say I think generally speaking, trade dynamism will ease over the coming decade everywhere. From that three to one rate of relative growth to GDP, nearing one. And I think that's indicative of uh, not globalization in retreat, but a new pace to the type of performance we were familiar with over the last 30 years. We think in Asia will, as I say, consolidate its position. And I think the nature of trade increasing the value add propositions that China exports, Asia exports, as well as in services trade, and maybe even in tourism too, over the coming decades. Um, we know well, for example, that over the next 30 years, two thirds of humanity is going to be residing between Africa and Asia. And of course, uh, a rising level of per capita incomes in that zone. Resources, although volatile, were enormously developmental in their contribution to Africa's near 5% growth over the last 20 years. We think that resources will become less significant over the near to medium term, of course, excluding that what we so-called forward-looking metals. Um, those will become significant, of course, and maybe nations such as the DRC will feature prominently in that respect. But to the extent that the industrial base, the middle class foundations of some of the world's emerging markets, not complete but fairly well entrenched, uh, the requirement for resources, at least in the volumes that we were familiar with over the last two to three decades, may not be as prominent, as fervent uh, as it was. Uh, but of course, that does not mean that mining is not profitable given the balance between supply and demand subject to that, uh, let's say, abating level of earlier growth. With regard to the African Trade Agreement, I have not said much really just to say I think that you, it will be incremental at best over the medium term. The foundations for an industrial base, meaning power, network industries that aid the, um, that commerce that's born of the industrial base, not to suggest that it's infant, but South Africa, the region, the continent, suffers from enormous capacity constraints in that respect. And sometimes during weaker economic moments, the pension for protectionist tilt, even if subtle, tends to rear its head. And we've seen, we see that type of developments in some markets along with uh, xenophobic tendencies, which certainly does not grease the wheels of trade. And then lastly, not a point that I touched on, not because I think it's subordinate at all. If anything, it is significant. Africa contributes the least to the world's greenhouse gases, but is likely to be the worst impeded, affected, as a function of climate change, worth concerns surrounding food production and, of course, allied food security. So. Only 30 minutes to discuss a very hefty topic that you have been allocated two days to engage on. I have no doubt that these themes that I've also spoken to will be teased further over the next two days. And I'm sure also a lot of smarter people with a lot more detail will regale you over this time. Thank you for having me. I hope that uh, it has been at least a uh, uh, somewhat celebratory introduction to trade patterns around the world and on the continent. But I think there are some questions, and I don't know if there's time. Uh, um, we so. do have a couple of minutes for some questions. There is one that has uh, come through uh, online, and we do have roving mics for those who want to ask questions from the floor. Um, while uh, if you could just get uh, a sense of the people who want to ask questions, if you can just put your hands up and we'll get a mic to you in the room. Um, in the meantime, there is a question that's come through and it says, how significant will, be, uh, will it be for the expected decline in Chinese financing for African infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Are other state investors capable of taking China's place or rather willing to do so? No, I think it's a very legitimate question in terms of the pools of capital. And I do have slightly elevated concerns over the near term.
So it's not just a case of uh, China at risk. I think even African funding markets, such as the euro bond market, local currency issuance, probably face more headwinds given the general debt heaviness of many African countries. The reality is it is not 2005, 6, 7 uh, in the aftermath of enormous debt relief and the capacity of African governments to borrow in a sustainable way. That's altered and that sustainability has been brought in question. And you're right as well, Anastasia, with regard to, to China's role. My feeling is I don't think China is necessarily going to cease or capital will necessarily substantially alter, but I think the pattern of capital provisioning uh, uh, will alter. I also do think that it will be probably a more benign level of commerce and funding between China and the continent than the first wave, which was perhaps, some would say, a little bit more predatory um, than it would be now. That said, I would also say European and North American pools of commercial capital, especially with interest uh, all along the East African corridor, could be more lively than many expected. Many would necessarily or instinctively expect. And I think from Ethiopia to Mozambique, the underlying project opportunities in that market is fairly rich, especially not just post-pandemic, but also, let's say, post-Russia and Ukraine. And East Africa, that enclave, um, as you know, I would have hinted at my cheer for that zone relative to West Africa. I think there, as, as a gate, it harbors, harbors both gateway status and burly economic growth over the near to medium term. So I think from a demand perspective, commercial capital uh, will, will still continue to seek uh, home in those markets. Um, any questions from the floor? Uh, there is a question over there, if we can get a mic to... There, there is one right behind you. Thank you very much for that very interesting background. My name is Manja Bimans. I'm with Credit Europe Bank. We are based in Amsterdam. At the background of the reliance, albeit the small reliance, of Africa on Russia, how would you see the intra-African trade develop? And secondly, how would you see the need and the reliance, or the realization rather, of the need for the infrastructure development and the manufacturing capacity increasing on the continent itself mm -hmm. so that we can be more reliant on one another yeah. rather than being reliant on the rest of the world? How do you see that developing going forward? So thank look, you. we've been, thank you. We've been incredibly stuttering in that respect. And as I hinted at least twice during the formal part of the presentation, Africa's power constraints has really been the, the most major hurdle to shifting from a broad light industrial base to more heavy industrial base. But that is changing now to the extent that power supply, especially more, more than matters of power supply, is beginning to increase. But that's the oxygen that has been in fact throttled uh, and not given birth to more lively. And I think that will change somewhat. I think many countries have got growth plans, and I know this sounds a little academic to suggest this, but we also find in our analysis countries that have a growth plan tend to grow, or credible growth plan, tend to grow quicker than countries either without a meaningful plan or with a plan that lacks credibility. So a growth plan espoused by a fairly legitimate government has got a very clear correlation in to, to growth and especially infrastru infrastructure. And we see this across East Africa, for example. Um, South Africa seems to be re-arresting that uh, slowdown in recent years. So with regard to power generally, infrastructure, network industries, as I said also during the formal part of my presentation, I think that will continue apace as it has been in recent years um, but for the most part incrementally so because of the disproportionate fresh reliance on the private sector within an environment of fiscal constraints uh, amongst many governments. So many governments' ability to lead infrastructure out of public resources has been strained, uh, as I also alluded to. The private sector's role is, is going to be amplified, but many governments, if you look at especially you know, more recent national plans, that reliance on the private sector is obvious, patent, and, and is being emphasized. Just again, not to emphasize South Africa. In South Africa, the recent State of the Nation address by our own president uh, was ideologically 
jarring for a party that is typically socialist or developmental state in its orientation, suggesting that the private sector's role in creating jobs is, is paramount. Uh, so that ideological tilt as well as uh, encouraged because of fiscal shortcomings is increasing. So I guess ultimately the question, the answer to your question is confidence in growth plans, confidence in the growth tra trajectory of some countries, and private capital willing to fund and pursue those opportunities. And as I said, the world's altered in the aftermath of the pandemic. Supply chains and, and security of supply now are amplified. Um, and I think that could be at the margin constructive for the continent. One very significant African car manufacturer uh, is announcing increase on continent manufacturing supply for the continent as well as for the European market um, to help widen its, uh, its, its supply infrastructure. Uh, and security of supply is one of the underpins in that respect. All right, so uh, good luck. let's leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. That is Gulam Balam, who is the Chief Economist at Standard Bank. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation.